I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker and I'm gonna get her queued up here so she can get her slides up. Hi Beth, how are you doing? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm good. So everyone, Beth Morling is a renal dietitian and she's a nutritionist who specializes in CKD and chronic disease medical therapy. Uh, she works for, she's been on the Speakers Bureau for Akibia uh, for many years, and she's going to support some, uh, provide some data on controlling phosphorus. So uh, welcome to Hope Week, Beth. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here today with us. And uh, special thanks for the Renal Support Network for asking me to be here and Akibia for uh, helping to set this all up. So part of my passion within uh, dialysis and kidney care and kidney disease is helping patients to fit their favorite foods into their diet in a healthy and safe way. So today we're gonna talk about choosing foods to meet your phosphorus goal. So the first question, what is our phosphorus goal? A normal serum phosphorus is usually 2.5 to 4.5. And in CKD stages three through five, we're aiming to trend toward normal levels. For many years, we've heard 3.5 to 5.5, but recent research is showing that even lower is better. Um, kind of like Goldilocks and the three bears though, too low isn't good, too high isn't good. We want it just right, just in the middle. So what is phosphorus? It's something that we don't hear much about. It's difficult to find on food labels because only a handful of us kidney patients have to worry about it, but it's a naturally occurring mineral. It is essential for our bone health and our teeth and metabolism. It's found in many foods and in natural preservatives. And this is where we get into some trouble because it's... Um, not always easily identified, and we'll have a slide on that in a little bit, but the food industry is able to say that these chicken nuggets that you're buying frozen have natural preservatives, and they're often phosphorus-based, just for an example. Um, 85 to 90% of our total phosphorus is in your bones and teeth, and our goal is to keep it there. So why do we care? High phosphorus or hyperphosphatemia is a problem when your kidneys don't work the way they're supposed to. And I really try with all my patients and my clients to not use the word normal all that often because we're, what is normal? Who's really normal? So I always say when your kidneys don't work the way they're supposed to. So phosphorus and calcium go together. I refer to them with my patients as kind of like twins. Wherever one goes, the other wants to go. So we want them in our bones and our teeth. But if our levels get too high within our bloodstream, if the phosphorus is too high, calcium is going to come out of the bones and the teeth and meet with it. And uh, vice versa, if calcium's too high, phosphorus can leach out. And that leads to weak bones bone damage, and increased risks of pain, even heart attack and stroke. And so uh, why the doctors get passionate about phosphorus, and sometimes I wonder if uh, we healthcare professionals care more about phosphorus than the patients do, but part of my job is to help us figure out why the, the healthcare professionals are so wound up about phosphorus. And the reason is that it's a preventable problem in most cases. And another thing that I really enjoy about kidney disease is that, as I describe it, the patient drives the boat. So much of it is diet driven that when we make small changes or we uh, institute small interventions, it can make a big difference in our long-term health and longevity, as many, many times the case with nutrition. So some common sources of phosphorus are colas, 
which are very high in phosphoric acid. And this is your Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, Coke, Diet Coke, Dr. Pepper, Mr. Pibb, um, Dr. Thunder, the Sam's Club versions, anything that's cola based. So you will notice that doesn't include root beer, even though it's a dark colored soda, it's usually lower in the phosphoric acid. And then processed foods and drinks. An easy way to think of what is a processed food or drink is anything that comes in a can, bottle, package, box. There are so many preservatives in those items so that if I don't buy that item this week, it's still available to be on the shelf next week or next month. Um, our enhanced meats and chicken. And with that, I'm thinking of um, kind of the difference between if you go to a butcher and you try to buy meat or you go to some of the big superstores and buy your meat, the expiration dates can be quite different on that. And some of the meats and um, chicken and poultry and that at you know your Walmart, your basic grocery stores, many of those are actually injected with fluid uh, water with some preservatives in it, often phosphorus based. Other things are your really processed meats like hot dogs, lunch meats, sausages, bratwurst, things like that. And then your fast food. Again, think of it as a preservative. Any of you that have found French fries under your seat of your car a month or a week or a year after you had those fries, they still look like French fries. That's preservatives. Um, and then your animal proteins, including dairy. So as we look at chronic kidney disease stages two, three, four, we're talking about a lower protein diet to try to help preserve kidney function. Once patients start dialysis, we encourage a high protein diet. And that's kind of a flip of the switch. It's a little bit different. Um, and so we have to balance that we're asking our patients to eat a high protein diet on dialysis, but also control their phosphorus. So that's something we struggle with sometimes. So hidden phosphorus is very, very common because of those preservatives. And I don't expect you to memorize all these, but you can clearly see that there's a phos involved in the ingredient. And this is gonna be your multi-syllable words that are difficult to pronounce on the back in your ingredient list on your labels. So it's not necessarily that you're gonna be able to look at that label and say, oh, it's high in phosphorus at a glance, like you can with sodium or protein or carbohydrates. It's gonna to have to be that you're looking a little bit further into your ingredients for any hidden uh, phosphate or phosphorus-based um, additives. And so I had my added my pictures there with the kids with the magnifying glasses. We have to be a little bit like Sherlock Holmes sometimes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So we want to avoid these very common foods to control phosphorus. And another big piece of my career is focusing on what we can eat as opposed to what we can't eat. I always use the example of if somebody told you that you could never eat, let's say, asparagus or Brussels sprouts, you can never eat them again. You may have not even been thinking about Brussels sprouts or asparagus, but I'd be willing to bet as soon as somebody tells you you can't eat them for some reason, that's all you're going to want. That's going to be your focus. So we're just going to do some brief avoid, and then we're going to go into what we can eat, what we can focus on, and what we have the power to change. So avoiding our colas, our flavored waters, like um, I believe Dasani and Aquafina, just to name a couple, they have flavored water where you can get uh, peach flavored water, lemon flavored water, watermelon flavored water. Those often have preservatives in them because they've added the flavoring to it. Bottled coffee drinks, I think of the little... Um, bottles like I know uh, Starbucks brand and some of those others and your bottled cappuccinos, bottled frappuccinos, all those kind of things. 
bottled and canned tea, um, also chocolate flavored drinks or cocoa. Um, it can be as simple as a little decision of, I really, really want a milkshake. Get a vanilla or a strawberry instead of the chocolate flavor can help to reduce some phosphorus. And then trying to avoid beer or ale, which um, can, it's also just higher in phosphorus than other alcohols. Also supersized fast foods. If you're thinking of the latest, greatest, giant, big king, super whopper, triple cheeseburger, that's adding a lot of extra protein and phosphorus to your diet, where if you just go with a standard hamburger, standard cheeseburger, you know, just the basic chicken sandwich, if you find that life has gotten busy and you need fast food to be your meal between the next, you know, before the next thing you eat, trying to avoid that super size, that's also going to help with weight and blood pressure and sodium. So trying to not uh, fall into the trap of the, do you want to upsize that? Do you want to supersize that? No, thank you very much. Also heavy cream sauces and then cheese and cheese sauces are also high in phosphorus. And when we think of cheese, I want you to think of the harder the cheese, the better. So think of your sharp cheddar, your Parmesan, um, some of those more um, dry, uh, dry or harder cheeses and trying to avoid things like cheese whiz and Velveeta and the processed cheese slices that come individually wrapped, you know, in plastic. Um, those are extra processed and so higher in phosphorus. So what can I eat or drink? This is what the million dollar question is for all of us. And I think these the pictures I chose were just stock photos in uh, PowerPoint, but I thought they were fabulous because this is how many of us feel. We're getting all this different information. Um, my favorite buddy in the world, Dr. Oz, has his opinions. You know, um, Woman's World Magazine, as you're checking out at the grocery store, they have opinions. Dr. Google, of course, I mean, we all consult Dr. Google. There's so much information out there. It's easy to go down a rabbit hole and be very confused. So a registered dietitian can be your key to uh, helping to figure this all out. And at the end, I do have a link for how to find a CKD registered dietitian near you. So our low phosphorus drinks, we're going to start with that. Um, for many of my patients, I've found if I can just get them to give up on the um, colas and the heavy cream-based coffees or um, the frozen drinks in the fast food that's like milkshake-based but with coffee and that kind of thing, we can really make a difference in their phosphorus just by their drinks. So... Water, of course, always is our preference and adding your own flavoring, getting a, uh, an infuser if you want to be fancy. If you don't want to be fancy, I can't be bothered with that because I don't want to wash the inside thing. Uh, but just throw in some fresh fruit, some lime, some lemons, um, blueberries, mint. Um, I had a patient who put dill in her water and that was, that was her thing. That's what she liked. So adding your own flavoring. Brewing your own hot coffee or iced tea, or when you're going into the gas station, they brew it in most places, they brew it in a coffee pot. You know, it's brewed. It's not a pre-packaged mix that is creating the coffee or tea. And then try to skip the milk or cream. You can go with a non-dairy creamer, but even those can be a little bit of a slippery slope. So if you're somebody who likes a little bit of coffee with your creamer, we may want to just work on the proportion of that and put more coffee and less creamer. And then lemonade, um, clear sodas, and milk alternatives are also very good choices. Other things we want to look at are plant-based meals 
fresh fruits and vegetables, and then home cooked meals, making your um, your foods from scratch, and looking for kidney friendly recipes, which I have I have some links for that as well at the end. Um, our fresh fruits and vegetables are always going to be a good choice because we've got the added fiber of a fresh fruit or vegetable. So that's a good thing. Helps to control blood pressure, blood sugar. Um, and fresh is always best if you can get it. Um, if you can't, frozen is a good option. If you can't do either of those, then we get into more of the canned things. Um, home cooked meals. So trying to cook, uh, batch cook is something that I try to get my patients to do where you're cooking on a day that you have time and then you freeze or put into the refrigerator portions for later in the week. And then when you make baked goods from scratch, even as simple as pancakes or um, just a regular cake, you're going to make a birthday cake, making it from scratch instead of out of a box is going to be lower in phosphorus. And think about before I said, you know, anything that's in a can, bottle, package, plastic, it's going to have preservatives. So that cake mix or the pancake mix comes in a package in a box. So lots of self shelf stabilizing uh, additives in there. And then choosing fruit-based um, desserts rather than necessarily maybe chocolate or cream-based. So having a slice of apple pie or cherry pie, blueberry pie, instead of like a tre leches cake or, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the other one. Uh, you know, basic chocolate cake with chocolate icing. If you're out at a restaurant, you're trying to choose dessert. We're trying to stay away from dairy. So try to avoid things that are uh, served with ice cream you know, skip that. You can hold the ice cream and just have the piece of pie. And then vanilla and spiced flavored treats like cookies, um, cakes, things like that. So when we talk about plant-based meals, this was a, a bit of controversy for several years and there's emerging research coming out all the time about the benefit of a plant-based diet. And as Americans, we eat way more meat than we need to. So um, trying to cut back on the meat part of your meal and focus more on your sides. So many people will say, well, does that mean I have to go vegetarian? No, you don't have to go vegetarian per se. You don't have to go vegan per se, raw vegan. I mean, there's all these, these variations, but just trying to reduce your animal-based foods, such as red meat, um, you know, pork, chicken, all of that. And um, we have found that it does help to slow the progression of chronic kidney disease, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. There's many benefits to the plant-based diet. So how do we start? And the easiest thing I would say is to start with your sides and then add some protein. So when you're thinking about preparing your meal, don't think, okay, well, tonight we're going to have pot roast and we'll have the potatoes and carrots and onions that go with that. Or tonight we're going to have chicken breasts. And so we'll have potatoes and green beans with that. Instead, think about what sides you would like and try preparing two vegetables instead of just one as your side. And then your plate becomes a little more spread out so that your protein is taking up less space on your plate and you have more of, of the other things. So maybe some noodles or rice or potatoes as a side for a starch and then carrots and green beans or, you know, broiled Brussels sprouts or whatever you like. So as you build your plate around your sides and just leave a little spot for your protein, you're naturally reducing how much protein you're taking in. And by protein, I mean chicken, fish, eggs, uh, beef, pork, any, any sort of animal protein. And then replacing some of those animal sources of protein with um, plant sources, such as legumes, nuts, soy, tofu, or grains at a meal or snack. 
replacing more of our processed grain products also with whole grain products. That's going to help as well. And the whole grains have so many benefits. And for years, we thought that you know, um, people with kidney disease should only eat white bread and saltine crackers and um, try to avoid those whole grains. What we've found is that the fiber in the whole grains has benefits in and of the uh, in and of itself. And then also the organic phosphorus that's found in those naturally occurring foods really doesn't get absorbed into the body and do damage like the additives. And that always takes me back to that phosphoric acid in the cola. So what are some typical serving sizes of plant protein? So I listed them below so you can start to include them in your diet and one or two servings of these different plant proteins can help you to get the protein you need without the burden of the added phosphorus. So we've got cooked beans, we've got nuts, and notice a quarter cup of nuts, not a quarter of a jar of nuts or a quarter of a can of nuts. Um, about two tablespoons of a nut butter or spread, cooked brown rice or noodles, whole grain bread, meat alternative. And one unit we mean like, um, one veggie burger or one uh, veggie sausage, one of those kind of things. And some of those are so good. I really encourage you to try those. Watch for when they're on sale. That's the best time to try. So some resources for the CKD diet and phosphorus. The Renal Support Network, which you've all found to be here, has uh, wonderful resources on there. Um, the Cooking Doc is also a really fascinating guy. So he is a doctor who loves to cook and has lots and lots and lots of videos and recipes, specifically kidney friendly. The National Kidney Foundation also has a bunch of recipes. They have really good solid resources um, the Find a CKD Registered Dietitian is the website kidney.org forward slash CKDRD. And we started that a couple years ago as I was working with the National Kidney Foundation because doctors were saying, okay, I want to send my patients to a dietitian, but we don't know who specializes in kidney disease. And it really is a specialty because... Um, in most cases, the average hospital outpatient dietitian doesn't see a lot of kidney patients. A lot of the folks who are experts within kidney nutrition work for dialysis companies, and so they don't see private patients. So the CKDRD uh, web address there, it's a great place to find registered dietitians who do specialize within um, CKD nutrition. And then the American Kidney Fund has the Kidney Kitchen, American Association of Kidney Patients. Um, they have some really good recipes, which I believe I pulled one of them uh, here toward the end. And then the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which used to be the American Dietetic Association. Um, but the Academy also has some really good uh, recipes and resources. And um, the American, uh, I'm sorry, National Kidney Foundation and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics have paired up to um, make sure that our resources align in our message and um, wording as well. So I wanted to give you some of those resources. Unfortunately, as I was putting this presentation together, I Googled, you know, kidney friendly recipes and all kinds of things came up. So what I'd like to point out as you look through this list is primarily the websites I pulled end in .org. And when they when the uh, ending of a web address is the .org, it's often a nonprofit organization rather than somebody who is just trying to sell you something. So they're, they're uh, 
they're most often the resources that I use and other dietitians use as well. So here are just a couple examples that I pulled the, uh, to add on to here. Um, uh, there was the American Kidney Fund I used for the linguine. I think that's where that one came from. The spicy veggie vindaloo with naan um, came from, I believe, Fresenius. Davida has a really nice website that they um, have lots and lots of recipes as well. And um, then Northwest Kidney Centers also out in Seattle have a bunch of really good recipes. That's where the lemon blueberry corn muffins came from. So I tried to offer you a breakfast, a lunch, and a dinner there as an example. And then that's all I have because I wanted to leave time for questions. There's usually lots of questions and conversation that wanna, want to uh, be addressed after that. So we left time for that. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. We do. I'm going to start, start with the first one. It's from Peggy Billups. And she said, had high phosphorus mostly because I had a hard time taking the horse pills, Renagil, while nauseous. Can you answer that um, if you have trouble taking pills? Any suggestions? Yes. So um, what she's referring to are what are called phosphate binders. And they are prescribed for patients with kidney disease, uh, usually on dialysis, but oftentimes before dialysis as well. And uh, what those medications do is they bind phosphorus and um, whatever the compound is in them. There's a couple different varieties. And they bind them together in your tummy so that then it passes out with your stool and you never miss it. The trick and I have said this many, many times, is, you know, we can put a robot on the moon or on Mars, but we can't make phosphate binders any smaller. So a couple options with that is, um, I'm trying to think. So Fosranol comes in a powder and also Renvella comes in a powder. So that's Civellamer and um, Lanthanum. So they both do come in a powder form um, with the Re Renvella Rena gel. You can't crush that pill. So you would need to have your doctor order it in a powder. And um, those don't really dissolve in liquid. They suspend. So as you are trying to drink it down, it kind of has a, a metamucil texture to it, which some patients struggle with. But you can also just sprinkle them on your food. As long as you're getting that packet in, it will bind the phosphorus. Um, recent uh, Kadoki and Kadigo guidelines, which are uh, both global and United States guidelines for kidney disease, are recommending avoiding calcium-based phosphate binders like Tums or uh, calcium acetate. Um, but there are other formulations. There are two iron-based binders. Velforo is one of those, and um, that's made by Fresenius, and then Arixia, made by Akibia. Um, they're all worth certainly discussing with your doctor to see what would be the best fit. I think if you have side effects, um, somebody was saying lanthanum powder is no longer available. Um, oh, goodness. You need to talk to your doctor about it. Um, and it's also very important to take your phosphate binder while you're eating, right? Not an hour later. <laughs> right. And a lot of times, yes, you're absolutely right, Lori. A lot of times patients will have stomach upset because they take the pills first and then eat. So I would suggest eating part of your meal and then taking your pills and then finishing the meal. That way there's some, some food and phosphorus for it to work on. Um, a quick a a question by Sherwin Collins. If I buy animal proteins such as sausage and the ingredients are just meat, maybe salt. I mean, if you're, if you're not limited on salt, are they safe from phosphorus? Well, you're going to naturally have some phosphorus that occurs naturally in, in all animal protein. It's just part of the compound that makes up animal protein. So that would be a better choice. And I've had patients who have actually had uh, sausage made by local um, butchers so that there's minimal salt added, but still lots of herbs and spices. 
and they do not add a phosphorus uh, preservative to it. So it would be a better choice. Um, there's a couple of questions from Anna Cho and Janine. When you said sides, you indicated potatoes or canned potatoes or beans. And then Janine said, will you discuss if formally forbidden high phosphorus legumes and dried beans are now okay as plant-based CK diet? What about a dialysis diet? So that's a couple of okay. questions combined. Okay. Um, going to canned vegetables first, your canned potatoes and canned green beans. Um, you'll want to rinse those first because they're often um, canned with salt water. So you want to reduce your sodium on that. Fresh is always best. Frozen is your second best. And then canned would be your third. But I've had many patients through the years that canned were their only options. Um, so in that case, yes, just rinse them. I think they'd be okay. Um, what was the next part? I'm sorry. Oh, well, legumes. About, yes. About, you know, because the, the science has changed a little bit and especially potatoes. Yeah. I mean, if you're on dialysis, you can slice them and soak them and dialyze them. We have that on our website to bring out some of the potassium that's in potatoes because you can have a little bit of everything. Yes, absolutely. And portion control is always the key. So to get to les, uh, legumes, absolutely, they can fit in the kidney diet for sure. Um, like I mentioned, the science is changing and our traditional renal diet that's been in place for almost 50 years, it, <coughs> excuse me, is changing as uh, science has been able to show that those naturally occurring bits of phosphorus that are in uh, dried beans and legumes are not near as absorbed in the body and don't affect the bones nearly as much as the phosphorus additives. Yeah, because it's also a question by Paula. Um, she has two of them. What about canned fish? Too much phosphorus. I imagine there's a lot of sodium in that. But and um, she also thought nuts are a no-no, high in phosphorus. And we need to really reemphasize there's the CKD diet, the dialysis diet, and then the transplant diet um, of whatever stage you're in. So please try to answer that. And uh, that would be awesome. Okay. My answer for nuts is always to measure them because it's very easy to say, oh, just a handful of nuts. And that's always when my patients wish they were six foot seven and had a massive hand so they could have a massive handful of nuts where you know somebody tiny would have a smaller handful. And so uh, the serving size for nuts is about a quarter of a cup. They are high in phosphorus. They can be high in potassium too. So if we're talking CKD, not dialysis, a question you want to know is what is my potassium trend? Because we never really look at just one number. I want to see over time, how is my potassium trending? How is my phosphorus trending? And so if you're potassium is doing fine. Um, we don't have to worry as much about that. If phosphorus is your primary concern, then having, you know, a handful here and there, quarter cup uh, here and there of nuts can absolutely fit in your diet. What I want to say is be careful how you stack your day. And this, this applies across all disease states. But if we're talking about phosphorus, we want to try to limit our phosphorus for most people less than a thousand milligrams in a day. And I don't want you to get too caught up on that number, but we want to um, kind of look at the whole day. So if I wake up in the morning and I have a um, fast food breakfast sandwich with double sausage, double egg, double cheese, that's a fistful of phosphorus. And then later in the day, I'm running around and I just grab a soda real quick and I grab a Diet Coke. That's a bunch of phosphorus. And then at night, as I'm sitting by the TV, I'm going to have, you know, a handful of nuts. 
those nuts are no big deal in comparison to your massive breakfast sandwich and your Diet Coke. Does that answer that adequately, Lori? It does. I mean, and you really have to, um, you know, be mindful of what stage, how much kidney function, if you don't have any, you're on dialysis. If you're on daily dialysis or home dialysis, your diet is more liberal. When I was on peritoneal, I actually had to eat um, some more salt, a little bit more salt because I could take fluid off. Uh, Nick has a question. What do you do if you can't cook at your home? Well, you find somebody who can cook, Nick, and invite them to live with you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what, any suggestions for people who don't cook? Yes. And I would be curious what you are eating, Nick. So I have a patient who cannot cook in his home and he just rents a room from somebody and he tends to eat at seven from 7-Eleven on a regular basis, like almost three meals a day. And he really struggles with his phosphorus. So for him, his phosphorus binders are really important. Um, the, the pills that you take with your food. So in those situations, I would aim for, you know, if they sell apples or banana, if your potassium's not an issue near the register. Um, oh, it's a good question. Well, well you know, I, I might have a, um, there are, you know, there are things that you can do if you're cooking in your room to heat stuff up. Um, they have frozen white rice packets. You can steam some chicken in your microwave. Uh, microwaves are awesome. Um, you can make an egg in the microwave, which is amazing. I mean, I've done that a lot. So you can, you know, if you, I'm sure you have access to a fridge, Nick. You just got to get on YouTube and start exploring your creative cooking side. Because my husband can make an egg in the microwave. That means you can make an egg in the microwave. <laughs> And, uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's tricky because, uh, I I'm, I'm transplanted right now and I've had to change my diet a little bit and it's, it's, you know, I'm having to cook more. I can't eat a lot of garlic. I can't eat stuff that's hard on my GI system. So we all have to accommodate. Uh, there's a question about brine rice versus white rice, wheat bread versus white bread. And then there's avocados, which is my favorite food on the planet. Um, and I'm glad that I'm transplanted can eat them, but it, and then is one type of nut better than another? Okay. Um, I want to circle back to Nick just for a second. I saw in the chat, he put my problem is potassium, not phosphorus. So in that case, if you're trying to avoid potassium, total different P word from phosphorus, that's going to be found very commonly in as far as fast food in anything potato based. So potato sticks, potato chips, um, uh, orange juice, uh, mangoes, mango juice. I'm from Florida. So it, you know, anytime it's mango season, I, I can see that coming as a potential problem. Um, but trying to, trying to stick with the, um, the apple juice, cranberry juice, grape juice, things like that. Go, just circling back to Nick. And I'm sorry, Lori, again. Well, well, there was one about the different types of bread, white bread versus yes. wheat bread. And, yep. um, and then, um, you know, is one type of nut better than another? That was Sherwin okay. Collins. And Got then um, Anna Choi has said about potatoes are not for people with kidney disease because of, of potassium. And also beans, but I, I think, you know, I've heard canned beans, if you, if you have some canned beans and you rinse them quite a bit, you can have a little bit of them. It's changing some of the science. Is that correct? That is correct. The science is changing every day and there's more and more research going on. And for years, we were told white bread only, white rice only, white crackers only. And that's just not the case anymore because there are so many added benefits to the whole grains. So your whole wheat bread, which make sure it's whole wheat bread, not just brown white bread. Um, and um, the whole grain crackers, 
uh, legumes, all of that. There are vitamins and minerals in those foods that are beneficial. Fiber is beneficial as well. So that science is changing and um, the more and more research is coming out to support that th that is the case. I've had many patients with kidney disease who struggled with constipation and switching just simply from the traditional cornflakes, rice krispies, uh, puffed rice, switching to a brand cereal was a game changer for them. They were able to use the bathroom much more easily and no ill effect on the phosphorus from that. Is one nut better than another? Not that I'm aware of. Um, almonds got a really good reputation not too long ago, you know, eat whatever it was, 12 almonds a day, and it'll help your heart. And that was because the almond growers funded that study. So we didn't have the pistachio growers do a study. We didn't have the cashew growers do a study. The peanut folks didn't get in on it. So that's where the press comes from. So anytime you're looking at a, at a research study, do look who funded it. If it was a university or, um, you know, if it was a company, what is that company's end game? You know, going back to sugar versus artificial sweeteners, it was the sugar industry that funded all the research against artificial sweeteners. Well, and I think it's so important to say that because, you know, um, all of a sudden wine will be good for you. Chocolate will be good for you. And it's just a, it's just a marketing ploy. Um, yes. We have a couple of questions and I'm going to try to re um, combine them. Uh, but I did want to say something about nuts, because in my lifetime, if you, especially people who've been transplanted many times or have scar tissue, uh, I find it's easier to eat the softer nuts if I eat them. The, some of the harder nuts, um, it can lead you to get like GI issues. And if you're having like a GI issue and you've eaten a nut or something with seeds, it could be because of, you know, um, some of the GI, the constipation issues, and they can get, they can get stuck and it's painful. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, Lacey Margaret has asked, what do you think about wild game like venison? Is that safer? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think it's just if it's if it's caught, I hate, I, I mean, we have vegetarian here. I'm sorry The um, if you uh, um, the fresher the meat, the less phosphorus, like you said. Um, Correct. And also, what about pea protein? There's pea protein said, what do you yes. think of pea protein? And then um, we also have a question from Paula. I think it was answered, but about soaking canned veggies and water to reduce phosphorus and mm -hmm. then is canned tuna okay i'm, I'm throwing okay. a lot at you here okay, okay. that's all right um so with canned vegetables the main thing you're rinsing for is to get rid of the sodium if you can get a no salt added canned vegetable that's going to be very beneficial for sure um rinsing canned beans is an option Absolutely. Um, usually by rinsing the beans too, you're getting rid of some of the added carbohydrate in there as well, because the, the cloudy uh, liquid that's in the beans, if you can rinse off that cloudiness, you're getting rid of some of the starch. Um, again, reducing the sodium in the canned beans. But as far as rinsing off phosphorus, not to my knowledge. Canned tuna. Um Canned salmon, any of those canned meats are going to have more sodium, which is more of a blood pressure concern. Um, rinsing those or uh, trying to get the, the ones in uh, just water instead of oil can help with calories as well. But there's no way to really rinse out phosphorus. Um, we did have a comment about avocados, and I want to just specify oh, yeah. if, it, uh, you know, the avocados are high in potassium. So yes. if you don't have a problem with potassium, um, you know, and again, you need to talk to your own doctor and dietitian about these, but, uh, and then there was, you mentioned brown versus white rice. Is there much different, um, especially on your, if you're on dialysis? No, I, I would, I would argue even on dialysis at any stage, the fiber is going to benefit, uh, 
way more than the phosphorus is going to influence your your uh, your phosphorus levels, your blood work. And then going back to pea protein, that would absolutely be um, a fine vegetable protein. Sure. And then somebody asked, I'd love to find a veggie burger that isn't high in sodium. Any suggestions? I don't know. Um, I, I would pull the audience, see if anybody else out there has found one. I, I don't know. I think mushrooms are low. Um, mushroom base burgers are usually um, a good choice, but it's tough. You know, it's, it's a, uh, when I was on a strict renal diet, cause I was on dialysis for 13 years. I mean, I would just try to put per perspective. I'm grateful I can eat and I have food, you know, and there's food available. Some people don't even have food available. I'd have to recalculate my thoughts. Um, uh, and, and I do, I think we have a podcast. We have a lot of podcasts on cooking. And um, I actually interview a dietitian and she talks about what she would make for the weekend. Cause sometimes it's hard to be creative. And I have to specify, Mrs. Dash is like my best friend. Um, they have so many incredible ways to spice up stuff. So um, uh, also too, people are talking about the soaking of canned veggies in water and reduce phosphorus. Um, I think there's some literature that's showing that sometimes the beans, if you have a little bit, if you rinse them, um, I think we had a podcast on that. Uh, we'll try to find it and send it uh, in the chat later. Um, but other than that, I think um, this has been wonderful. Uh, Beth, I, I, yes, you have any final one, thoughts? One last thought is we keep going back to vegetables and phosphorus. And vegetables are more potassium. Your meat and animal products are going to be more phosphorus. So potassium and phosphorus can get very confusing, um, but there's very low phosphorus in vegetables, canned or otherwise, most of the time. So it says, can you just use dry beans? Um, and I mean, I guess that would be a phosphorus question, but you have to I guess you cook them. You just have to make sure you do portion control. Yep, absolutely. And that's where combining a serving of beans. And I tell my Hispanic patients, you know, if you're used to having a whole plate of rice with a whole second story of beans, cut those beans in half, spread them thinner, you know, so that you're, you're controlling the portion um, more so than restricting uh, a culturally essential food. Right. You know, Beth, I just had my world shattered. I just found out that Mrs. Dash is no longer called Mrs. Dash. It's just Dash. There you I go. am always going to call it Mrs. Dash. I'm sorry. Um, it's just, it's just horrible. Who well, came up with that marketing decision. That makes me think I need to run Dash. <laughs> Mrs. There you go. Is always a little bit better. Well, thank you so much. I think we have everybody answered. And right now we're going to, um, I'm going to spotlight uh, Suzette. Thank you, um, everyone. Thank you, Beth, so much for your knowledge and time. And a shout out to our corporate mission partners for making this happen.